Hey now, Roto Grinders, Chris Tremino here for Roto Grinders Premium. If you are looking to continue your NFL slash football DFS action with the XFL for this coming season, look no further than Roto Grinders Premium. We're going to have projections each week on Lineup HQ curated to the best of our ability. We are also going to have weekly written content with core plays and much, much more. You do not want to miss this if you are looking to get some action in long after the NFL season has completed. Check us out, Rotor Grinders Premium, Lineup HQ. You're not going to want to miss it. Hey now, Rotor Grinders, and welcome to the Rotor Grinders XFL Primer Podcast here on rotorgrinders.com. My name is Chris Jumino, uh, analyst here at Rotor Grinders, and joining me to discuss our fantastic content and the XFL season to come is Matt Kajeski, NFL expert in his own right. Matt, what's going on this morning? Not too much. Excited to break down these XFL teams. There's a lot of intrigue around the league, a little bit of controversy on who is going to play. Hopefully we get some concrete depth charts in the coming days, but overall I'm excited, man. Yeah, that's one of the exciting parts about this league. You know, when you have NFL, you have existing data to work off. If you have depth charts, you have all kinds of knowledge about the teams and the players and the coaches. And really we're missing some key pieces and we're just less than a week away from the season. So it's going to be really exciting to see what transpires here this week. You know, there's limited beat reporting. There's limited information out there. Those of you who decide to do more work are going to have an advantage in your DFS contest. And that's what we're here to talk about today is what to expect from this upcoming XFL league, both from the league perspective and from the daily fantasy sites perspective. And let's jump right in. Matt, When you talk about the XFL rules and scoring adjustments, the number one thing that stands out to me is the timing rules, right? When you talk about the running game clock, when you talk about the 25-second game clock, talk about some of these timing rules that we're going to see here in the XFL because I think it's going to cause some pretty big swings in the way that DFS outcomes are heading our way. Yeah, I think the big thing the XFL is trying to do is increase scoring and take away some of the downtime we see in the NFL So a couple things that really stood out to me, the 25 second play clock. So to me, when I saw that immediately, it seems like they're trying to adjust for pace in the NFL. We see pace vary a little bit, but with a 25 second play clock, it's going to speed up all teams for sure. And then there's obviously the potential for a few of these teams to run at hyperspeed. And aside from the two minute warnings, we'll see a running clock. So I think that'll help the games move along quickly too. But I think most of this is designed to increase scoring. Yeah, but they actually are aiming to have the same number of total plays per game. So that's the one thing I'm curious to see is what actually happens to that total play count. How widely does it vary? You know, we could see games that are shorter in terms of total plays than the NFL. I think that would be very easy to see, especially when you talk about the caliber of player in this league. These are players that could not make NFL rosters. These are players that were not good enough to be awesome in preseason week number four, Matt. These are not extremely good football players by any means. So when we talk about, you know, what the execution looks like in this league, I'm interested to see, does this actually transpire to more scoring and more plays? Or is there something that's, you know, pretty net to what we see in the NFL? That's that's the biggest question mark for me. Yeah, for sure. Whether it actually ends up with more points on the board, I think that's the goal. I agree with you. I'm not 100% sure whether this will happen or not. But I think a few other of the timing things that are interesting, you know, they reduce the amount of timeouts. So I think they're trying to reduce these stoppages. The replays, the coaches really don't have any input in that anymore. There's an official that is going to be placing the ball. That's his only single job. So I think the goal is to speed these games up and kind of just move them along. Yeah, they'll definitely be shorter in terms of real time to play. You know, and then, and of course, you know, when we talk about DFS considerations, the comeback period, you know, is going to cause wide swings, you know, depending on how that's used and games where, there's teams trying to come back vigorously and they're successful, you know, that you could see DFS points jump very, you know, very high in that period of time. And then there's also going to be games where, you know, you can't necessarily run out the clock because you 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 no longer have that full 40 seconds. I think now the average is going to be 32 seconds as a maximum, you know, seven seconds to spot the ball, 25 second play clock. You know, you're not going to have people being able to run out the game. So there could be, you know, some very large spikes in DFS point scoring at the end of those halves. Yeah, for sure. I agree with that completely. And that doesn't even touch on the overtime stuff, which I'm sure we'll get to, which is, you know, it it reminds me of a shootout in hockey. So they're taking essentially one play a piece 
and they're alternating chances to score. And then if a team is mathematically eliminated, the game ends on the spot, but otherwise those scores are worth two points. We could see massive swings as far as DFS goes, even in just the overtime periods. Yeah, let's just talk real quickly about that. We'll jump into the gameplay innovations where we talk about overtime. You know, if you've got five plays on each side, they're all passing, you could end up with as many as, what, 40-plus points if they go five for five on each side and get into extra time there in the overtime. There are no ties in the XFL. So, you know, one, you know, two for the passer, two for the receiver, times both sides. That could be a huge jump in DFS contests. I'm really excited to see that if that ever goes down. Uh, how, how would you feel if you were not – you know, stacking a game that went to overtime, I, I, my heart would sink. Yeah, I, it, mine would too. I think it just had, lends itself a little more to the stacking that we already see in NFL. And I think that's probably going to be an edge right away because we just don't see people stack enough. And I think it's probably worth a little more in this kind of format. All right, let's talk really quickly about the kickoff because they, it's not like a hugely impactful DFS play, but there are some things we need to consider here. There's going to be a shorter distance between players, so they are going to still have the kickoff, but they're now going to start lining up on the 35 of the opponent's side, not on you know, the kicking team's side. So there's not going to be that big space between players, but they're not allowed to move until someone touches the ball or until it's been on the ground for three seconds. And they're basically trying to eliminate the touchback. It's a, basically a penalty at this point. If it goes through the end zone, it's a major touchback, 35-yard line start. If it goes through out on a bounce, it's a 15-yard line. You know, it's, a, it's what's called a minor touchback. So you start a little bit farther up, but you know, at the end of the day, kicking it out of bounds is a huge penalty. There's a lot of reasons that they are trying to get people to return the kickoff and put that play back into the game while keeping it safe. Yeah, I think they did a pretty good job of this. We won't see the big collisions from what I can gather. And then with the penalties you mentioned, not only will it offer just more special teams touchdowns for your, your lineups there, your DSTs can score points, but I think teams will have shorter fields as well. So you mentioned the penalties where you're starting on the 35-yard line, so that automatically cuts off 10 yards from what we see in a standard NFL game. Yeah, and they're also doing some things with the punt, too. The gunners can't move at the snap now. You know, if you kick it out of bounds, there's no more pinning teams back by kicking it out of bounds. That's a penalty now. Uh, so you're really going to start to see more opportunities for, for plays. And quite frankly, they're listening to the fans on this. and Everyone's bored by all this. No one wants to see – touchbacks and fair catches they really want to see these kicks getting returned and it's more exciting plays in the league Matt there's been a lot of hype about the double forward pass can you explain what this is and how you think it's going to impact our DFS rosters so essentially you can throw two forward passes on a play as long as the first pass doesn't go beyond the line of scrimmage so theoretically you could have a pass catcher getting a PPR point for reception from catching a ball and then whatever subsequent points they would get from a completed pass downfield. This has the potential for some pretty big plays. There's a couple guys on these rosters that we'll get to when we do our team by team breakdowns that have sort of the Taysom Hill skill set. They were dual threats in college. So I think we could see this play a role, you know, particularly on maybe a jet sweep pass, things of that nature. I'm not sure how much it'll be used, but it could swing DFS lineups if it is implemented. Yeah. It, you know, it's, to me, it's going to be like a minimal impact type of a situation. Like, it's, I, I don't really see this being that much of an advantage as compared to being able to throw a lateral pass. It's just going to make it a little bit easier to execute things on jet sweeps and, you know, possibly find something. Like you mentioned some dual threat players. There are some guys, uh, including a guy who's basically a quarterback, uh, who's going to have the opportunity to make some plays in that regard. But I'm not sure yet that this is going to be like the biggest impact rule change, probably more for hype than anything, if you ask me. Uh, we'll talk about one foot in bounds. I think that's a big rule changer. Are you aware of this rule? Yeah, definitely. It just basically we're returning to the college game where you get one foot in bounds. It just allows more circus catches, more catches overall. We should have less controversy in some of these things. So I'm excited for it. Just more catches overall. Yeah. And the rest of the rules here, you know, not necessarily as big for DFS, but again, more in the vein of improving the play quality in the field, making it go faster, improving the fan experience. They've got coach player communications. They basically want to have better information available to the players, not just the quarterback as they go up to the line so that they can run plays faster and more effectively when they do so. Uh, they've simplified the illegal man down field rules so that it's easier to understand. And so that there can be more RPO type plays run effectively in the league. And they've shortened the halftime, so they're not going to have this big break in between the halves. It's basically 10 minutes, and we're back on the field trying to get that game time under three hours. Matt, it's going to be an exciting league. 
you've heard some of these rule changes, quite a bit different from the NFL, and certainly some things to consider here for DFS. Yeah, one last one I think we didn't touch on is the extra point situation. Teams will not be allowed to kick extra points. Instead, you'll have the option to run one of three plays. A play from the two-yard line is worth one point if it gets in the end zone. A play from the five-yard line is worth two points. And a play from the 10-yard line is worth three. So just one other little rule change that could influence lineups a little bit. Yeah, that's huge because, uh, you know, certainly from an over-under perspective, uh, when you get into a situation where you can now get more different types of spreads, uh, that can come through. You've got easier to come back with the three-point play if you get a couple of teams that can hit that. More game theory involved from the analytics side. So that's a very exciting rule change I'm looking forward to see here in the XFL. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the DFS formats and scoring for each daily fantasy site. On DraftKings, they're going to allow you to roster with the $50,000 cap they usually use, a quarterback, a running back, two wide receivers, two flex positions, and a defense and special teams. And Matt, when you take a look at this, the defense and special teams, that could be yet another way that it's going to be difficult to predict things in the XFL early on that could really swing a game. How are you approaching that position? Right now, I just want to see how these teams kind of use the DST special teams. One thing I think we didn't mention with some of the punt rules, I don't know if teams will be more likely to go for on fourth down rather than punt, you know what I mean? So maybe we just see straight up more turnovers and less special teams opportunities overall that could just be basically long fields where we see punts or maybe just the kickoffs where some of these teams make impacts. But overall, I still think we probably see a little more scoring than just the standard NFL with the rule changes that they've implemented. I love the two flex positions, especially since with the way that they are trying to push passing in this league and some of the you know, game philosophies that we'll see when we get to the team by team breakdown, you know, deciding on what, whether to use a flex position on a running back or use a flex position on a wide receiver has everything to do with how we see these games start to play out and how the usage and utilization starts to play out. You know, we don't have the answers to some of these things as far as, you know, how concentrated backfields will be, how much running backs are involved in the passing game, how, how much skill players are involved in passing themselves. You know, those flex positions make this a very exciting format for me on DraftKings with full PPR, of course. Uh, looking forward to it very, very much. Now on FanDuel, They've eliminated the defense and special teams on that particular site. They've got just the quarterback, running back, uh, two wide receivers slash tight ends, and two flex positions there. But once again, Matt, are you, are you, do you have any devious plans for this flex spot? How are you looking at this as you enter the season with the unknown? It seems like the league is trying to push passing. And I think aside from a few teams, we will see a lot of timeshares at the running back. This is kind of just guesswork right now, but there's a lot of teams that use, you know, a lot of draft capital on backs, multiple early round picks on backs. And then we see just from a coaching philosophy standpoint, there are a number of coaches that do have a distinct background in passing games, air raid style schemes, run and shoot style schemes too. So my initial lean is potentially some of these alpha receivers with just occasionally mixing in some of the backs we think will get a larger workload. But again, it's really hard to say right now. All right, Matt, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this particular broadcast. People want to know who are on these teams, who can we expect to be relevant in daily fantasy contests as we move through the year. Of course, everything comes with a grain of salt because these depth charts aren't actually officially released yet. The XFL may be doing that at some point later this week, but for now we're going to have to use our best educated opinions on these situations. Let's talk about the odds on favorite per DraftKings Sportsbook to win the XFL championship, the Dallas Renegades. Matt, tell me about the coaching. Tell me about what we can expect from the scheme here in Dallas. So we're looking for the Dallas Renegades. They're plus 325, coached by Bob Stoops, and Hal Mum is the offensive coordinator. He's known for being a fantasy-friendly coach. He ran air-style schemes throughout his tenure in college. At quarterback, we have a little bit of a, I wouldn't say a controversy, but Landry Jones suffered an injury early in camp it's looking like he's tentatively expected to miss the first game he's I'd still probably list him as questionable not a lot of info on the situation but then behind him we're looking at Philip Nelson as the starter we don't see a big price dif difference between them especially on DraftKings they priced up a lot of the studs but you know playing with Hal Mum, I think we could see some fantasy production regardless of who plays quarterback Eric Dungy's also on the roster he's a dual threat from Syracuse but I like Nelson right away. What do you think about this Renegades team? 
Yeah, so I'm not I'm not really sure what's happening here at quarterback for week number one. Jones is obviously the guy. As soon as he's back and ready to play, he's going to play full snaps. He has one of the biggest job securities in the XFL as far as I'm concerned at the quarterback position, as we'll talk about later. That is not always the case on each one of these teams. Uh, but when you start to break down you know, this team as a whole, I think there's a lot of good skill players that we recognize uh, from other situations. Like Cameron Artis Payne is going to lead this backfield. By all accounts, in rush attempts, you know, you'll see Lance Dunbar and some other guys on this roster get involved in the passing game. But since this is going to be a pass-heavy scheme, I'm sort of looking at Cameron Artis Payne as being someone that's going to do some things that we haven't seen in the NFL. You know, maybe he will get involved as a pass catcher. But otherwise, you know, I'm not really expecting too many more guys uh, you know, not like a split committee between three or four guys. I'm expecting Cameron Artis Payne and Lance Dunbar to be the primary work forces here in this backfield. What do you think? I think so too. And one thing to note, Lance Dunbar was banged up in practice already. So it looks like he's questionable at best for this game. And behind Lance Dunbar, we're looking at Austin Walter, who had some preseason success with the 49ers and Marquise Young, a UMass kid. I don't really expect either of them to really function into this backfield. I think you're correct in thinking that it'll be Cameron Artis Payne. We do have a lot of really interesting wide receivers here too, though, which is why I think we might see some production. And the prices are really interesting. What are you thinking about a wide receiver? Oh, baby. Now we're talking. Let's – okay, so first I want to talk about what, one of the guys I think could get overlooked. Uh, I wouldn't say overlooked, but more overlooked than he should be early on in the season by the name of Jeff Badet. Now, this is a guy, 95th percentile, you know, straight line speed, 93rd percentile burst. Uh, he's 5'11", 182, so he's like sort of a – he's either going to be operating in the short area on, on shorter passes, run after the catch, or on, on long bombs. And I think he can get it done in both ways in this league. This is – like you said, this is going to be air raid. So we'll see a combination of both of those things, you know, the, the horizontal passing game as well as, you know, once, once you get a little bit too comfortable defending that, they'll take you deep. And uh, with, uh, with Jones, a quarterback, I do expect Jeff Bidette to have at least one long touchdown early in the season. Uh, he's one of my favorites to lead the league in, in overall receiving. And I'm just really excited about what he can do. You know, the downside is he's not that traditional X receiver. So why don't you talk about their, their actual traditional X, Jazz Ferguson? Yeah, Jazz Ferguson. First thing I want to note here is there's a major price difference between Bidette and Ferguson. Ferguson's almost half the price. That's on DraftKings. He's 4.2, which was really shocking to me. But Ferguson, he's one of these size speed specimens. So he has the speed similar to Bidette, but he's big. He profiles as an X receiver. He had a cup of coffee in the NFL, very productive with Seattle in the preseason, didn't end up making the roster. I think he's an early favorite here to play that X role and see a lot of these downfield targets you talked about in this air raid style offense. But one other sleeper I want to mention is Flynn Nagel, who's received some hype from the coaching staff. There was a couple favorable quotes from him. He's super cheap and he profiles more as a slot specialist, kid out of Northwestern, just a name to watch, you know, in these air raid style offenses, you never know who could end up seeing a little bit of production here. Yeah, I read a little bit about him too. I, he's one of the big question marks, right? Like I don't really know what to do with some of these guys that we – and until we see depth charts, until we see games, it's hard to pin, you know, what is his market share of target percentage right now? Like how would you project that? It's very, very difficult uh, when you look at the – you know, you got names like Freddie Martino, former NFL player in there. You've, you know, Josh Crockett, uh, you, Donald Parham, the giant tight end. You know, how, what's his share going to be in this offense? I think he could very well be an impact player, uh, especially near the goal with, the, with that kind of size in this league. You know, there's not going to be a lot of physical specimens like him out there. So a lot of really exciting pass catching talent, a lot of opportunity, a lot of touchdown equity, quite frankly, here on this Dallas passing game. And I'm really excited about them overall. I, I don't know if I tend to agree that they're definitely the favorites for the championship, but they're definitely the favorites to score a lot of a lot of passing, a lot of passing offense, a lot of passing touchdowns. So I'll be interested in DFS, no doubt. Yeah, me too. All right, let's talk about the next team here, the, the D.C. Defenders. Now, this is a team where the, another favorite quarterback of the league is being touted uh, as you listen to different XFL broadcasts across the land. Cardell Jones. You know, th now, this is another big guy. Talk about him at quarterback and talk about how you feel he's going to translate here to the XFL because he wasn't real good in the NFL. No, so he's the Ohio State kid. He's most known for winning that national championship kind of on the spot. That was when JT Barrett got hurt. I actually don't really know about the job security here, and it's because of some of the things you mentioned. He never really was productive in the NFL. He's known as kind of this dual threat rusher, but behind him, they essentially have the same player in Tyree Jackson, who's actually bigger. He was the Buffalo quarterback, Buffalo in the Mac, not the Buffalo Bills. 
And he ran in the four fives at six, seven 40 yard dash. He's the dual threat guy as well. So with Jones, I don't know how long the leash is. Again, we don't have depth charts. Everyone's pegging him as the favorite on DraftKings. He's priced above 10 K, but in the long term, I just don't know how long his leash is. I think it really depends, you know, how much is athleticism going to matter here in this league, right? Because I don't think his athleticism is what caused him to fail in the NFL. I think, you know, maybe some more of his, his accuracy issues and his ability to use the mental component of the game might have been where he struggled to land in the league. Now, in the XFL, are those things going to matter as much? I think that's one of the things that we're going to find out real early is how, you know, how much are these, you know, these athletic QBs are going to be able to overcome what I would consider some of their overall quarterback play deficiencies. But I do, I do think Jones early for right now is fairly secure until he starts to screw up uh, with his job security. The running back position, though, in this team, that, I get really excited about this. Now, I've heard people talk about Danell Pumphrey, and, and that's, that's fine. But really, Jarrell Presley is the guy that gets me jacked. Uh, th this guy was awesome in the AAF last season before that league folded. Uh, he, you know, he's got the, the skills to play as both a runner and a passer. So I think he really fits the format of the game well here in the XFL. And you know, what do you think about Presley? I, I think he's probably going to be one of the DFS studs for the season. Yeah, I agree. He's a top three back for me right now. You know, this is a guy that ran a sub 4 four forty yard dash. He catches the ball well out of the backfield. Really does everything well for this offense if they're looking for a true three down back. You mentioned they do also have Donnell Pumphrey, who was supposed to be the Darren Sproles replacement in Philadelphia before he flamed out. He's another athletic kid. Not sure how much they'll use him as a pass catcher, but Presley certainly does have that skill set if they want him to do everything. Yeah, so Rashad Ross is a guy that actually got traded to this team at the wide receiver position uh, from Los Angeles. It was a one-for-one -one trade with Tri for Trey McBride, who I actually liked last season in preseason NFL DFS. He actually think, came through on a week uh, where he was expected to produce for the Jaguars. But that was a very interesting – you don't see one-to-one -one trades at the same position in the NFL very often. In the XFL here, I imagine this is a scheme fit situation. Uh, Ross was very, very productive in the AAF last season. Of course, did not catch on with the Carolina Panthers and – now he's back in minor league football. What are, what are you doing with Ross here? I think this is a big question mark too. Like a lot of people think he's going to be as good as he was in the AAF. And I think that remains to be seen. I agree. A couple of things I noted about the team overall, it really seems like they're going for speed. So Ross in the trade, he's a sub four, four guy. They have Deandre Thompkins, a kid out of Penn state who ran a four, three, three. We talked about Presley's sub four, four, you know, Pep Hamilton is this coach. And I think he has varying levels of success throughout his career worked with Andrew Luck where they were really attacking down the field. So that is kind of the scheme fit, I think, here with these fast guys. But then again, we also saw Pep Hamilton really struggle under Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. But the speed thing, you know, it really stands out to me. But like you mentioned, Rashad Ross just coming over through, from the trade, he's reportedly still learning the offense. So I'm not even sure about his role week one. I'm more likely, I think, to target some of the cheaper guys. We see Ross above 10K, especially on DraftKings. DeAndre Thompkins is below 5K, and then they have Eli Rogers, who profiles more as a slot specialist. That was kind of his role in the NFL with the Steelers, but he was really productive there. I'm not sure that Rashad Ross has a significant leg up on some of these guys, like you said. Yeah, I saw Simi, Simi Cobb scored in one of the preseason games. You know, you, you, you mentioned Eli Rogers. You know, he was more of a slot guy in the NFL, but will his skills definitely lend him to just being a slot guy in the XFL? I mean, could he actually go down the field and make some plays? I actually think that he could. So there is some interesting situations to monitor here with the passing game, Ross being the main one. Of course, at tight end, they've got a couple of guys who maybe aren't really at the top of people's radar, but Kari Lee's not terrible. Uh, I, I don't really have a great read on how they'll use him, but I am expecting him to be at least somewhat involved in the offense. Yeah, at Michigan, they were pretty good at using tight ends. So I actually kind of like Kari Lee as a, I don't know, a sleeper tight end prospect. Again, you're going to have to play him at your flex. There's no tight end roster slot in these leagues. So he'll essentially be playing, you know, a flex wide receiver for you. You definitely need some confidence in that red zone role to get involved with some of these tight ends. And until we see differently on the field of play, uh, the defenders I should note are plus 600 for the championship here with Hamilton as the head coach. So I actually think that as far as bets go, they're one of the more interesting championship bets. It really depends on the play of Cardell Jones. He'll ultimately govern how well this team does. But I've heard good things about their defense, which is, you know, we didn't even talk about defense, Matt. 
it's going to be a long ways until we actually know the, the skill and quality of all these defenses. And the defenders I've heard have got a pretty good one. Yeah, the defense – as far as DFS goes, like we talked about at the top, I think so much of, his, of it is going to depend on the special team stuff. Can teams score on kickoffs? Otherwise, a couple teams that do have good prospects. I know the Seattle Dragons, Channing Stribling is a really strong corner, a Michigan kid himself. And then I believe it's New York has Jamar Summers, the quarterback or the cornerback that was just the AAF stud last year. But those are two defenders I really saw. But otherwise, I think it's going to come down to special teams. Yeah, man. It's, it's going to be exciting to see. But I do think the defenders have a pretty good chance here to be pretty good here in the league. Okay, let's talk about probably the most exciting offense in the league, if you ask me. I want to talk about the Houston Roughnecks, also a pretty good name, if you ask me. Now, the Roughnecks are, you know, they're going to be coached by June Jones. Uh, can you tell the people a little bit about what to expect from a June Jones offense? Okay, he's probably not a name a lot of people have heard. He formerly coached at Hawaii and SMU where they run this, it's called the run and shoot offense. In this style of offense, you really see four or five wide receivers on the field sometimes and a lot of downfield passing. This team does not even have a tight end on the roster, so I'm expecting to see plenty of three and four wide receiver sets from June Jones. Oh, yes, and we've got some wide receivers to talk about, to say the least. One in particular that I think – is getting a lot of hype, probably should, but his pricing on the Daily Fantasy sites is also reflecting that particular hype. But before we jump there, let's talk about the quarterback situation because who is the quarterback for the Houston Roughnecks right now? Tell me now. I don't think we have a favorite. So <laughs> at first, everyone thought it was Connor Cook, the Michigan State kid. And then reportedly, he lost a battle to the former Temple signal caller, Philip Walker, PJ Walker, sometimes he goes by. But then as of this morning, you know, I was looking for some concrete evidence one way or another, and I'm seeing conflicting reports again that it could go either way before this, the season starts. So either way, I, you know, I don't think we would want to start at either of these quarterbacks. We could potentially see an in-game benching in week one. This is a particular note because the pass percentage that I'm going to project for this team is going to be very, very high. You know, especially, you know one of the reasons for that is when you look at the running back position, they don't really have someone who stands out as we need to feed this beast. They've, they've got an offensive coordinator and a head coach who are definitely looking to throw the ball and get down the field. Uh, dude, I'm telling you, whoever plays quarterback for this team is going to have value, but we can't even be sure they're going to last the whole game in week one. Yeah, I know. It's really problematic. I think instead, you alluded to this in the beginning, we should look to some of the wide receivers. And Sammy Coates, he stands out as the potential alpha, former 99th percentile spark athlete coming out of school. They have a few guys I like, too, as some sleepers. Khalil Lewis is a Cincinnati kid. He was really productive in college, didn't really see a lot of time, even in the preseason in the NFL. But the coaches have been hyping him up a little bit. And then there's this kid, Blake Jackson. He reportedly ran a 4-4-4 at the pro day. He's also received a little bit of hype. This is one I think we need to watch for a depth chart, but I think there's the potential to take some really cheap flyers here on guys like Khalil Lewis, Blake Jackson, even some other names, Cam Phillips and Ray Bolden, potentially whoever's on top of this depth chart. Yeah, and I saw Sam Mobley catch a touchdown in the preseason game. You know, he, he got open and got some yards after the catch to get in the box. I mean, they're going to have a lot of receivers on the field. I actually heard uh, one of their cornerbacks could actually line up here. I used to play in the NFL. James is the last name. But, yeah, I mean, they've got a lot of options here. That You're going to see some creativity, I believe, from the Houston Roughnecks. So that's why that quarterback situation is also very important to monitor. And, of course, Sammy Coates. I mean, he, as they're going to have a lot of options in the passing game, but I think he's going to be a guy that attracts a lot of targets. Like, you're not going to be able to avoid this guy in the field. He's a, he's a beast. Uh, he's going to be physically more talented than everyone he's up against. Uh, he's got tremendous catch radius. Uh, he's, he's got deep speed. I, I just think it's going to be hard to keep this guy away from the football. Agreed. I mean, in the NFL, so in regular season games, 18 yards per reception. I don't think anyone else really in this league can boast that kind of production. All right, let's talk really quickly about the running backs. You've got Andre Williams, former New York Giant, who's going to be leading the backfield, I suppose. He's, he is not priced expensively on DraftKings. So I imagine they're looking at this situation as one where – He's going to be an early down plotter, not involved in the passing game. That, that's hard to believe that anyone in this backfield is going to have zero involvement in the passing game. But at this point in time, that's how they're projecting it. It's hard to defend that when you look at his skill set. 
I am very curious about the situation because Andre Williams, he flamed out spectacularly in the NFL. I guess he's probably most known for slamming into the backs of his offensive linemen. But they also have D'Angelo Henderson, who's priced a little bit more than Andre Williams. I think he'll probably get the first crack at, you know, receiving work. You mentioned Andre Williams is not much of a pass catcher. But this has committee written all over it, for me at least for the start of the year, with maybe Henderson taking some pass catching work. And you mentioned Andre Williams is a size speed specimen. That's what he was known for in college. I think that's why he got drafted so highly in the NFL. You mentioned just the talent overall in this league. Maybe he's able to show a little bit of that size speed. I'm not sure at this point. Yeah, Henderson is certainly a guy that I'm keeping an eye on, a good sleeper pick. And then the other backs they have are Nick Holly and James Butler, neither one right now standing out as, as real threats to become something, at least early in the season. All right, let's move on and talk about the LA Wildcats. Now, this is an interesting team because they've got – a pretty good head coach, Winston Moss, and they've got one of the best quarterbacks. Their championship odds currently plus 600. Where are you at with the Wildcats here? How do you feel about this team overall? I think they're a pretty good sleeper call to make the championship. Norm Chow is their offensive coordinator. He coached under Pete Carroll at USC. He has some, at least, experience with dual-threat QBs. When he was with the Titans, coach Steve McNair, Vince Young, and he'll have Josh Johnson here, who is an older dual-threat. He'll be turning 34 in the season. Some of his offenses have shown, you know, an affinity for throwing the ball downfield too. So I think we could see some exciting football here. You know, Josh Johnson, I think, has the most success as far as his track record goes. He's been in the NFL off and on, had some success with the Washington Redskins. He's 33 now, but when he came out of college, he ran a 4-5-3 40-yard dash. So it does have dual threat ability here. I like Josh Johnson quite a bit and this entire offense. Yeah, I, I do believe Josh Johnson's the quarterback here. I have heard some random speculation that he hasn't really appeared in the preseason and that he's you know, maybe they are looking at McClendon or Chad Kanoff down the road as being the quarterback of this team. But I, I do feel that if, as long as Johnson is named the starter, is uh, atop the depth chart, he will be one of the premier quarterbacks in the league. He's got the running capability. Uh, that's great for DFS purposes. Uh, I do think that he is head and shoulders, talent wise, one of the better quarterbacks in the league. And if he, comes through as expected, this team will be very, very competitive. A running back position, this is interesting. Talk about Elijah Hood. I, I think this could, this could be a definite sleeper pick here. I don't think a lot of people are that excited about him right now. He's actually my favorite running back in this league right away. You know, he didn't come into the NFL with draft capital, never really stuck around on a roster, but the Wildcats use significant draft capital on, on him in this league. He came into the NFL as, you know, pretty good size, ran a 4 5 7 he never, again, never really latched on to an NFL team here, but also caught passes. You know, he had a 25-catch season, his final season at UNC. Does have the profile to be sort of a do-it-all back. And if we think the Wildcats are going to be good playing with leads, you know, I like him in potential game scripts he'll see this year. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, they've got some talent behind him too. Larry Rose, is, he's a guy, he got buried on the, wild, on the uh, hot shots roster last year I believe for the AAF didn't really get a chance but I I thought he actually was a pretty good player when I was looking at him he was in the NFL for like a minute uh I think preseason with the Rams or something like that but uh he's got a skill set that I think can be used in this league as well yeah he caught 133 passes at New Mexico State so if you're looking for someone that profiles as a strong change of pace back pass catching down back I'm scared Larry Rose kind of siphons off some of that work but I'm still hopeful for Hood yeah, and that, you know, and that's, again, one of these things that remains to be seen is the usage splits between some of these guys who are, you know, they're not head and shoulders different as far as what, how they could be used. The question is how will they be used. At the tight end position, Brandon Barnes, uh, not, not a bad option at all uh, for the L.A. Wildcats. I expect him to be one of the better tight ends in this league and very involved in the offense, but it's the wide receiver position that I think we have the most to talk about here with the Wildcats. Who's your favorite among this group? It's Trey McBride, your guy that came over in the trade. And I don't know what DK was doing with the pricing here on McBride. He's significantly cheaper than Nelson Spruce. And I kind of think he'll be the alpha day one. He's another guy that's sort of draft Nick's love coming into the NFL, ran a 4-4-1, so he has the speed too. The player he's competing with, though, is Nelson Spruce. And he has showed productivity really at every chance. Never latched on to an NFL team, but he was productive in the preseason. He was productive in the AAF last year. He was productive in college at Colorado. I think those are a nice one-two pairing here 
for the Wildcats. Behind them, you know, we have Adonis Jennings, little cup of coffee in the AAF. Jordan Smallwood, Saeed Blacknall had some preseason success. There's a lot of guys. Yeah, I think Blacknell is the guy to watch, right? So we think McBride's going to be involved here. Of course, he has an offense to learn. You know, will he get that done by week one? Probably, but remains to be seen. But Blacknell is the guy coming out of Penn State that I think could really do some, some damage in this league if he's given the opportunity to do so. 6'2", 208. Uh, he was playing behind some pretty good players there at Penn State. You know, obviously Saquon Barkley commanding the lion's share of the offense w- while he was there. But he was also playing behind Chris Godwin and dudes like Desha- Deshaun Hamilton, like guys who are starters in the NFL. So I actually think he has a chance here in this league. You know, if he couldn't, if he wasn't quite physically gifted enough to make it in the NFL, 95th fifth percentile spark athlete, I think Black now could do some things here. I agree. He's a really nice sleeper call. All right, Jennings is a guy that is he's the easiest fade in the entire. Like this guy stinks. I hope he. I hope they don't give him time. So he was a, a former <laughs> Salt Lake Stallion from the AAF, and he had trouble staying on the field there. And with the receivers we already mentioned in this. This receiving core, McBride, Spruce, Blacknall, I think it'll be hard for him to see playing time as well. Yep. Very talented roster there for the LA Wildcats. I am a fan of them tentatively. Let's get on to talking about the New York Guardians head coach, Kevin Gilbride. Gilbride, most notable for his time with the New York Giants uh, back in the, in the day with Eli Manning. Let's talk about what you think here for the Guardians. Not a lot of optimism out there for the Guardians. Their, their championship odds, not some of the best here. How do you feel about this team? Their team, I'm unsure on. Gilbride's been out of football for a little bit here, so I'm not sure how much he's going to embrace aerial concepts. I think that's some of the reason for concern when we have some of these coaches that are very clearly going to embrace the pass. At quarterback, they do have someone I'm interested in, in Matt McGloin. He looks like the starter. He never really made it past backup status in the NFL. Had a, a little bit of success, I should say. But... There is also a little concern here with Marquise Williams on this team, too, the former UNC quarterback who could play a Taysom Hill role in the XFL at the very least, if not work his way into the starting job if Matt McGloin struggles. But ultimately, I think this is one of the offenses to monitor early on in the year. Not sure how much they will you know, embrace the pass as far as run pass splits go. I think they'll be balanced. And the reason I think they'll be balanced is because they have a very diverse skill set at, at running back. Uh, you've got Tim Cook, who's sort of a grinder, uh, big big back, uh, can, can really run over people. And, of course, I, I sent you that clip of Darius Victor literally running over somebody in one of these preseason games. That dude's got a 99th percentile body mass index. He could probably absolutely MJD over some people in this league. And they've got Justin Stockton at running back as well. Uh, three, three players that I think very hard to peg as far as the usage is concerned early on. Right, Darius Victor is a guy no one's talking about, too. So nice little name drop there. Matthew Colburn's also on the roster. He's a former Wake Forest kid. He had some productivity at the college level, never really made it to the NFL. But, you know, Tim Cook profiles as your big sort of Brandon Jacobs style back. And Justin Stockton, right now, I guess I would say profiles as more of your smaller scat back, pass catching back. But we'll see how this shakes out. I do like Darius Victor as a sleeper call. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, man. It will depends, right? He's got to earn his way into the field, I think. But boy, it, it's hard to look at that. It's hard to see him absolutely demolish somebody like that and then think that they're just going to automatically hand all the early down carries to Tim Cook. Uh, but we'll see. You know, right now, a lot, a lot to be learned about these teams. And, and that's one of the situations that is the most up in the air to me. At the wide receiver position, I don't think this is really up in the air at all. I think it's Mikhail McKay as the ex- alpha in this offense. I think it's Taylor Redding on the other side. I think they're a pretty dangerous combination. And I think McGloin is probably one of the quarterbacks most, you know, suited to, you know, really play with precision here in this league. So I actually like this tandem quite a bit. Yeah, they, they kind of suffered a little bit of bad injury variance in the beginning of the year. Lost Angelo Yancey, lost Tanner Gentry. That would have been an amazing wide receiver core. Mikhail McKay, Profiles is the alpha. He's priced like it, too. He's very successful in the AAF. I think we'll see him see a large target volume here. But Teo Redding is someone who I think, you mentioned it, is a very nice sleeper. He's 6'1", kind of slight in his frame, but he ran a 4.4640 or dash, so another fast guy that can get down the field. Joe Horn is someone else I'll mention near the minimum price. Some of the coaches on the team called him their fastest player. Not sure how much weight to put into that, 
but I guess worth mentioning near the minimum, if they're running three wide receiver sets, my guess is we probably see McKay, Redding, and Horn. Redding, just 25 years old. Uh, he came in with the Lions, never really did much in the NFL. Uh, 6'1", uh, 181, but I, he's, he's able to play a little bit bigger than 6'1", if you ask me. I, I, he's got an 86 percentile catch radius. I, I think that if you watch some of his highlights from college, he's definitely able to make big plays. We saw some of those big plays being made already in the scrimmages. Uh, I'm interested to see what he can do. I think he's probably underpriced on DraftKings, albeit it's hard to say what any of these guys are going to do in this league. There's a lot of unknown, but I do like him quite a bit. Uh, as a week one sleeper. Anything else here on this team you want to make mention of? I've seen some hype on Colby Pearson. He's priced kind of in a mid-range. He's above Horn and Tail Redding. He's not someone I like coming out of BYU. He maxed out at just 384 yards in college. So I really think it's going to be Redding and Horn that kind of leapfrog him on the depth chart. I wouldn't be looking too much at Pearson at his price. All right, let's talk Seattle Dragons. This is a team that everyone is thinking is going to be the worst team in the XFL. Their championship odds do show that. It looks like they're going to be plus 1,100 per DraftKings Sportsbook to win the title. Head coach Jim Zorn, give me a sense of what this team's going to look like offensively. Well, they have Mike Riley as their offensive coordinator. He is a well-known run-focused head coach. Under Riley, the AAF commanders finish with the fewest passing yards in the league. Brandon Silvers is their quarterback. He reportedly beat out B.J. Daniels for the starting job, but I'm not really sure that it matters because of Riley's focus on the run. They spent two very early picks on Kenneth Farrow and Trey Williams, and it looks like both will receive work in this offense. So I'm expecting a run-heavy approach here for Seattle. Yeah, it's, it's looking run-heavy, but they've got the tools to do it. You know, Kenneth Farrow... Uh, he was productive in the AAF last season. A lot of trends there, right? A lot of AAF players in this league that are looking like they're going to have big roles in the XFL as well. That was almost a, a nice training ground for some of this semi, you know, this uh, minor league football action we're going to see. Uh, Trey Williams is a diverse skill set back, probably going to be more involved a, as a pass catcher than a runner. Jaquan, Jaquan Gardner, though, that's the guy that I think, like, if, you know, I'm, I'm actually disappointed in Pharaohs here. I, I think Jaquan Gardner could be a lead back in this league. I mean, he's got some shifty moves. He made a big play here in the scrimmages, just displaying what we saw in the AAF again. I'm actually interested in what he could do. I don't think he's like a week one guy, but if he captured a role that's bigger than people think, I think he could definitely be a sleeper in the league. He was really successful in the AAF. Almost average five yards per carry. The problem here is just they spent their first round pick on Trey Williams and they spent their second round pick on Farrow. So... You know, I don't know how much these teams are going to weigh draft capital, but in the NFL, first-round players certainly see the field. They're given that kind of first-mover advantage. So that's what I'm kind of expecting with Trey Williams and Kenneth Farrell to form a one-two punch. But Jaquan Gardner was absolutely successful when he was on the field in the AAF. I'm just worried about the role. I'm also worried about the game scripts considerations here with this team. You know, you mentioned they do have a good cornerback on this team, but, you know, outside that, a lot of people are thinking that this is not going to be a very good overall defense. And uh, if, if this is a run first team and they're behind in games in the AF with the rules that we talked about to start this broadcast, that does not bode well for someone like a Jaquan Gardner. No, definitely not. So I, I think if we do see this team in negative game script, who are the receivers we can really look at? And I think this is one of the weaker receiving depth charts in the AAF. We're looking at Case and Williams and Keenan Reynolds, who was – Reynolds in particular played quarterback at Navy on that triple option offense. He was someone I thought that might see a gadget role similar to a Taysom Hill, but we'll see how he is used. But ultimately, I don't think there's a lot of exciting receiving options here. No, man. Keenan Reynolds, uh, I mean, 25th percentile speed, 10th percentile speed score. I mean, he's 5'9", 190. He's not exactly – closest comparable to Jeremy Curley. He's like – so generic store brand Jeremy Curley is what you got with Keenan Reynolds. Not exactly the most exciting and enticing option that we can talk about. Austin Prohl, another twerpy little thing out there running around. Uh, he's, he's in the family business of slot receiving. I don't think we can expect too much out of him. And then, of course, you've got the tight end situation, which is also fairly bland. Colin Jeter looks like he would be the main pass catcher in this offense, but not, not seeing too much that I'm getting real, real excited about here. No, I think their odds are pretty spot on as the long shot to win the league. 
All right, let's talk about the St. Louis Battlehawks next. Now, this is a team that I think has a pretty wide range of outcomes, but for the most part, I'm not expecting them to be in contention for the XFL championship. Uh, their odds to reach the championship are plus 1,000 on DraftKings Sportsbook. Give me a sense of what we're looking at coaching scheme-wise here. Coaching scheme-wise, it's going to be tough to evaluate. Jonathan Hayes, the head coach, offensive coordinator Chuck Long, neither of these guys have really coached at a significant level in almost 10 years. Both have plenty of experience, but it just hasn't come for a while here. So without too much to draw on, I'm tentatively expecting more of a balanced approach here. This was a team that invested significantly in the running back position. There were some quotes talking about being a downhill running team. But again, with the odds we're looking at to win the championship, is this team forced into more pass-heavy game scripts? They have Jordan Tiamu at quarterback, the old Miss kid, who's been questionable at best throughout his career, known most for underachieving with DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, and Dawson Knox at Old Miss. However, he does offer some athleticism, which could enhance his fantasy value. Boy, imagine having that crew and not being just like the best quarterback in college football. I mean, that's, that's a crew right there. And that, that, does, that does say something, but we're also talking about now competing at a much lower level of talent professional-wise. So he wasn't able to really stick uh, with the Texans at all, despite their injury concerns to start last season. Uh, but I do think that in this league, he's not an absolute lock to be terrible, but I do echo your concerns that he hasn't really shown us the ability to be something special in the past. And certainly the people he beat out, Taylor Heineke, Nick Fitzgerald, they're nothing to write home about either. The running back position, I think we do have a little bit more to be excited about. Okay, you know everyone who's played NFL DFS before is going to talk about this one. Give me the lowdown on Christine Michael. So Christine Michael, everybody knows Christine Michael. He's the athletic, you know, almost 100th percentile spark athlete coming into the NFL that never quite translated that athleticism into on-field production. Everyone's going to want to play him. He's a little bit expensive at 8,400. There's other running backs on this roster. So my first inclination is to kind of fade him based on those things. I think the name recognition will just bring high ownership. Matt Jones is also on this roster the former Washington Redskin who had a decent amount of carries in the NFL. Keith Ford is on the team who played a little bit with the Raiders. All three of these backs do have NFL experience. So I'm not 100% sure Kristen Michael gets all of the work, but I do think he is the favorite to lead this backfield in carries. Yeah, Matt Jones, uh, for sure, someone who's been productive in the league. Uh, he's, I'm actually a little surprised he wasn't more productive in the league when, when I saw what he was able to do when he was on the field. But, you know, here we find him in the AAF, and I think that he's certainly talented enough to have a role here on this team. I actually think that this wide receiver group, there's not going to be a lot of known names. We don't love the quarterback, but there's some potential here for these receivers to do something. What do you know about L. Damian Washington? I think he's going to be the lead guy here. It's not going to be like a massive share, but I do think that he'll be probably undervalued at least to start the season. He was a productive AAF receiver on Salt Lake but he suffered an injury in his time there. So he wasn't actually able to, you know, put up the big season long numbers that maybe we expected from him. But I do think he is the favorite to lead this team. Basically all the hype coming from the coaching staff is going to LaDamian Washington and Carlton Agadosi, who's the former Eagle preseason star. Otherwise, DeMarnay Pearson, L. Keith Mumphrey, not seeing quite as much hype there. So I do think it is a concentrated receiving share between LaDamian Washington and Carlton Agadosi. Yeah, I don't really have a strong read on where they're going to go usage-wise in this team, and it's a problem. You know, as we're trying to create projections, as we're trying to create, you know, usage expectations for this team, you have already mentioned a bunch of guys who could be involved. Pearson L could very well be the leading target getter on this team. You know, he's somebody who, you know, we saw him pop up with the Raiders for a little bit. He actually was on the Raiders until recently. Uh, just uh, joined the AAF a little bit later in this process. You know, you got guys like Alonzo Russell, who's not completely useless. I mean, I'm, you know, Brandon Riley, I don't know, he's not great, but I mean, he's, 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 a, he's a body on this team that could do something. You, Marcus Lucas, I've heard the coaches talk about. I mean, there's really a lot of different guys that could end up being the second, third, fourth option on this team, and we just don't know the answer to it right now. And that's all after we, we haven't really talked about the tight end. Do you know anything about Cole Hunt? He looks like he could be a player here. I actually expect him to be one of the most important players on this offense. Yeah, he's someone who's had productivity at really all levels of his career. I think just the main question with the tight ends, you alluded to it earlier, 
how much do they have to do where they become flex considerations? So that's kind of my question with every single tight end, you know, are they getting in large enough target share, seeing targets downfield, or is the red zone share high enough where we actually want to consider these guys over maybe a potential bell cow back or an alpha receiver? Keep in mind, a player's touchdown expectation is pretty much going to reflect positively on their extra point expectation as well. It's something else we need to project here in the AAF is, you know, what percent, what workload percentage are we expecting from these players in the extra point game? You know, how, you know, there's a lot to be considered there. Like how often are the teams going for one, two, three, et cetera, and so forth. We're not going to have any, probably by the end of the season, we won't even still have a, a full data set of what we really need to do great projections for the XFL. But I do think uh, someone like a uh, Cole Hunt among the tight ends, who could matter the most, especially if they're priced appropriately. Anything else here on the Battle Hawks? I don't think so. I think the sharp move or the move I'm going to take in week one is fading Christine Michael versus someone else. I'm expecting high ownership there. Yeah, I, I think that remains to be seen, but I, I do not disagree with that possibility whatsoever. All right, the last team in this league is possibly the most interesting and unknown as far as I'm concerned in this league when you talk about the Tampa Bay Vipers. Not a lot of people who have been covering the league as far as the fantasy community is concerned have been real high on them. But then we see the odds come out, you know, plus 450 uh, for, for the championship on DraftKings, not too bad. I've seen Caesars came out with win totals and they had the Vipers as the highest win total of anybody you know, a couple weeks ago. I, I think they took those lines down, but there were seven and a half. Uh, some love being given out there from the bookmaking community for the Tampa Bay Vipers. Talk about their coach and scheme and why we think they could be surprising to some people. So Mark Tressman is their coach. He's most known for his time in Chicago, Baltimore. And then he was a wildly successful coach at the CFL level, multiple championships there. He's a pass heavy coach. And I think most notably, he's known for targeting his running backs out of the backfield. So of course, Matt Forte for many seasons, you know, Matt Forte, the hundred catch year. And now he gets Aaron Murray, who was surprisingly productive at the AAF level. He completed 64.8% of his passes. He's a dual threat, had 96 yards on the ground with his legs. That was in a limited season, but it was pretty productive in the context of the AAF. I think the real question here is who is Murray going to potentially target out of the backfield? And this is something I don't have a strong sense on. Maybe you could shed some light on the potential pass catching back. Yep, and this is where I talk about the mystery of this team. Right now, I have no choice but to presume the lead back, Devion Smith, is the guy that's going to play the Matt Forte role. I can't possibly project Matt Forte numbers, per se, and not as peak anyway, but I do think that you know, his share of rushing attempts will be mid-50s, something like that, but the target share probably over double digits, 11%, 12%, something like that, is where I'm currently leaning with Devion Smith. Of course, we don't know a lot about Jock Patrick, Mac Brown. You know, what, you know, they don't have a lot of running backs on this roster. I mean, are either of these guys on the roster to catch passes? As of now, can't answer the question. Maybe it's Quentin Flowers who gets a big passing game role. You know, we talked about the double pass. I mean, is there anyone in this league more accustomed to be executing the double pass than Quentin Flowers? I, I like that call a lot. He was someone I was thinking about that could exploit that double pass rule. As far as the pass catching back, you know, Devion Smith has never really been a productive pass catcher in his career. It's not so much that he can't do it. I just think he hasn't really been asked, asked to. He was in that Jim Harbaugh offense at Michigan. They don't really ask their backs to do much there. Jock Patrick, I think, potentially could be a change of pace guy. He caught the most passes out of this group at Florida State where he was buried behind Dalvin Cook for a while. So I don't know, at least a little bit of intrigue there. But my tendency is to agree with you that Devion Smith should handle most of the work. Yeah, Flowers is the probably the wild card for me, right? Because his his actual position is listed as QB RB, I believe, right? It's it's two positions. Yeah. So he's going to play. Like Aaron Murray is not going to have 100% of pass attempts for this team. That's pretty much for sure. Uh, the question is, how big is that role? I see it currently as fairly small, like relatively small. Can't project him as someone that is definitely playable yet. But I could very easily see me being wrong about that. In the first game, you know, he's out there for, you know, 10%, 20% of quarterback snaps. You know, I mean, who knows? Like, we have yet to see what Trestman's got planned for this team. But certainly, he's got the coaching staff and the skill players to be able to at least execute at a productive level, right? We'll call it that. The Guardians are one of the better defenses in the league. I don't want to talk about matchups just yet. But I am, I am 
tentatively expecting some offensive success here from the Vipers' backfield. Yeah, I agree completely. The receivers I'm not so sure on. You know, we saw this team lose Antonio Callaway very early on. And now I think it's a little more difficult to peg who's going to catch the balls. Do you have any sense on the receivers? Yeah, so Alex Dunlap of Roster Watch was at the Rotor Garders party uh, with me. And I, I, I said, give me a name, right? I was asking him for a name from the Senior Bowl. He thought I was asking for XFL. So he looks at me and he goes, his name is Shontavious Jones. And I kind of agree, right? This guy played in the XFL. He had the X-Alpha role. Uh, I, I believe it was for the iron in the XFL. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he did definitely have a lead duty you know, type of a role in the XFL. He didn't really do that much with it. But he kind of fits the profile of someone who could be the, you know, the main dog in an offense like this. 6'3", 208, uh, fairly good burst score uh, per playerprofile.com. 92nd percentile catch radius uh, comparable to Nate Washington. I think he could be a player in this league. Yeah, he played for Atlanta in the AAF, and they were pretty clearly the worst team in that league. So he was never even really given a chance to succeed. What was most notable to me about Shontavious Jones is, you know, they used their second round draft pick in the XFL on him. So he does have draft capital. I think that'll put him on the field. You mentioned the size, speed stuff. So I think we'll look and see Shontavious Jones as the number one. But behind him, man, Tanner McAvoy, Stacey Coley, Dante, Die, Reese Horn. Do you have any – Dan Williams is on the team, Jalen Tolliver. Do you have any lean out of those five or six names for the potential two and three role? Okay, so currently I am leaning in the direction of Stacey Coley and Reese Horn. Again, shrug, because it's the XFL, a lot of unknowns right now. We haven't seen a depth chart as far as how they see it right now. Uh, but Coley's a guy who I was a little surprised wasn't very used or productive in the NFL. Uh, he was with the Vikings to start his career. Uh, he's got, you know, some speed, 65th percentile straight line or uh, height adjusted speed. You know, he's got, he's six foot 195, probably more of a slot receiver if you had to break it down. But I think that that could lead to some target share. Uh, closest comparable and player profiler to Robert Woods. Uh, I'm interested in Stacey Coley a little bit. And of course, Reese Horn was in the AAF as well. Uh, he also uh, sort of a bigger bodied uh, possession type guy. Yeah, the, the only other name I was kind of interested in was Tanner McAvoy because of his recent success with Seattle. Apparently, that hasn't really translated over into this league. I haven't seen a lot of hype on Tanner McAvoy in the XFL yet. The only other name I saw getting some positive quotes was Dan Williams. He reportedly had a really nice scrimmage for this team, maybe carving out a role for himself. The last thing I'll mention is Nick Truesdell, their tight end. I think he's yes. worth mentioning after the Vipers spent their first round pick on him. And he's known as a pass catching tight end. And again, tight end's going to be a little tough to project right away. Hopefully the extra points or the lack thereof should boost some of these, you know, bigger bodied receiving options near the end zone. One thing that's for sure with the tight ends is maybe we can't project them to be as useful as the wide receivers that remains to be seen, but we'll definitely be able to tell which one of these, guys can siphon away the touchdown equity from some of these other guys, right? I do think like someone like Truesdale uh, will make it harder for someone like Sean Sean Tavis Jones and these other guys to really dominate in in, in total share if they're as useful as these coaches think he's going to be. They're they're really excited about him. They they basically called him the best tight end in the league. Yeah, absolutely. And seeing first round draft capital on a tight end is kind of eye-opening as well. Ultimately, I really want to target this team with Tressman kind of leading the way. But there's question marks really at every position from the quarterback down through the running backs and the pass catchers. All right, Matt, let's get into some closing thoughts here. You know, we talked about these eight teams in the XFL. The season starts February 8th. We're all excited about that. Uh, When you talk about overall, just looking at the information you have in front of you now, which team are you tentatively looking at as being the most successful in the league? So I think the team we just talked about, the Tampa Bay Vipers, Like you mentioned, it was really interesting seeing bookmakers favor them. And I think you can't really deny Mark Tressman's success at the semi-pro level in the CFL. Multiple championships there, never quite translated to the NFL. But he certainly does have a track record for winning some of these titles. So they're my early pick, my favorite team right now. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about my favorite team, but I'm going to talk about the team that I'm interested to see how much better they do than expectations. It's the New York Guardians, right? They're going to be running a more of a balanced attack. They're not necessarily set up the way that I think the XFL wants their game to look, so to speak. But I think in terms of real football success uh, with Gilbride at at head coach, I do actually think they could outperform 
But it, again, it's, it's so much is up in the air. Everyone's, you know, really excited about the roughnecks and the renegades and, and, and the pass first type approaches. But when you see what the backs look like on that roster and some of those wide receivers, you know, there is some potential for them to be more successful from a betting perspective. And I think some people think they're in New York. Finally, I want to ask you about your top overall fantasy player. Who's the player that you're the most excited about heading into week one? So aside from the quarterbacks, you know, I think the, the Wildcats have a really interesting basically depth chart across the board for fantasy. I like Elijah Hood at the running back position. I think this is going to be one we need to focus on with only one of them in our lineups. You know, we could potentially get multiple alpha receivers in DFS lineups. So I like Elijah Hood as a running back who did catch passes coming out of college. He's on an offense that does project to throw the ball. They have what appears to be the most productive quarterback, at least as far as track records go with Josh Johnson. I'm expecting him to score some points, and maybe that elevates his touchdown equity as well. But I like Elijah Hood quite a bit. Yeah, I want to see what's going on with the wide receivers in Dallas. You know, we've got, you know, we've got Stoops, we've got Hal Mummy, we've got the, the pass-first approach there. You know, I know that there is a lot of uh, hype here on, on Jazz Ferguson and Jeff Badette. I really want to see which one of these two guys ends up being the alpha dog. Uh, for me, it, it's, you know, it's definitely Badette that I'm really interested to see if he can really become something that we've never seen before. He was, he was a high draft pick in this league. Uh, there, the offense seems to suit uh, what this league is, is pushing for. So for me, really, it's the speedster but that, that I want to see how he does in this league. I'm excited to see how it translates. Folks, that's going to do it for the Rotor Grinders XFL Primer. I wish you the very best of luck in all of your DFS contests out there. For Matt Kajeski, I'm Chris Germino. We'll be back again very soon with more content for the XFL here on Rotor Grinders.